Hello, folks, and welcome to James Hill Sports. I am he. I am joined by a special gentleman. He is the football coach on the highest of seven hills at Florida A&M University. Folks, as you know, he is Mr. Willie Simmons, coach, first and foremost. I hope you, your family, the fam you leave, all the gentlemen on the football team, everybody in Tallahassee is safe and sound. Uh, first and foremost, talk a little bit about the back-to-back -back victories in the Florida Classic. Well, God, great to be on, James, and uh, this is a very exciting time. Um, great weekend this past weekend down in Orlando. Um, everything from the luncheon to the Battle of the Bands uh, to all the recruitment. Uh, and culminated in a great game on Saturday. And um, obviously, um, you know, the team down south had their run, uh, but now we can claim the last two. And so uh, very excited to be able to bring the Florida Blue Florida uh, Classic Trophy home again to the House of Seven Hills in Tallahassee where it rightfully belongs. And uh, we definitely want to keep it here as long as we can. So just uh, great to send those seniors off uh, with a big victory and in, uh, in the rivalry game that, of course, everyone who bleeds the orange and green circle on the calendar every year. Coach, talk a little bit about that rivalry and what it means to you personally. And obviously, uh, you told me after the game, uh, your turkey dinner will taste a little bit better this year. Well, you know, obviously, this is a, a huge rivalry. It's one of the biggest rivalries in all of college football, uh, has been for a long time. Um, you know, whether you grew up here in Tallahassee, in North Florida, or in any part of the state, um, you're, it's inevitable that you're going to run into a wildcat. And so, you know, it may be at, at, at your workplace, it may be your next door neighbor, uh, you know, at church, or you may even be married to one. And uh, so the bragging rights for 364 days uh, is really what we all look forward to. And so, again, it's a game that everyone has circled on the calendar, like I said before. And uh, the trash talk has officially begun about this win. Uh, but even going into next season when, when we uh, get it on the football field once again. Coach, uh, the 2022 season began with a lot of optimism. Uh, the Rattler Nation always behind you. I remember coming up to training camp uh, in Tallahassee, and you had a lot of talent there. Uh, you bring in Jeremy Musa, a phenomenal quarterback. Uh, he can go over the top. He can go to the sides. He can make all the throws. Uh, he comes in from Vanderbilt. Talk a little bit about the optimism coming in and some of the playmakers you had on the team as you look at the 2022 season. Yeah, well, obviously, you know, bringing Jeremy in, we really wanted to create a healthy quarterback competition uh, with Rashawn McKay, who was our incumbent. And, um, you know, we knew we had a lot of talented skill players, you know, led by Xavier Smith, uh, Jamari Sheree, David Manigo. Uh, the, the Rack Boys 2.0. And, um, you know, we got some talented tight ends uh, and, and we had some running backs that we felt gave us a chance to, to do some things in the run game as well as pass game. And so, you know, bringing Jeremy in, uh, unfortunately, Rashawn was forced to retire from the sport uh, due to you know, some health issues. And uh, Jeremy took over the reins and, um, you know, played a pretty solid season to throw for over 2,700 yards, 21 touchdowns uh, to 10 interceptions. Uh, and, and, you know, finished second in the conference in most statistical passing categories. Uh, I think he had a great debut season, and, and I think his future is very bright with this program as he goes into year two in this offense. But a lot of excitement around the team because of our strong defense and guys like Isaiah Land returning uh, with our specialist, Chris Fadul and Jose Roma Martinez. Jamari Sharid was, you know, coming off of leading the nation in punt return yardage. And so, again, a lot of promise. Uh, and obviously the season has started where we want it. Uh, but I think we were able to pull ourselves together and have the, the type of ending that we that we envisioned when the, when the season began. Coach, as we know, HBCUs, uh, sometime there's challenges with uh, enough resources and enough human beings and faculty and people around to get things done. Uh, talk a little bit about uh, the what happened right before North Carolina. But you go into into Chapel Hill and your team is a resilient football team and you have a great showing and people are looking around saying, wow, fam, you we knew they could play, but but they really showed up. Yeah, you know, obviously, you know, uh, what what transpired uh, to begin the season has been well documented, um, had some certification issues uh, with some of our returning players, with some transfer student athletes uh, that we had to work through. And, uh, you know, we didn't get them worked through in a timely fashion, 
So it forced you know, over 20 players to be deemed uh, ineligible uh, to, to compete you know, for the first couple of weeks. And so we, we endured that. Um, that led to a lot of open and honest dialogue between our players uh, and the administration. And, and I thought it really uh, resolved itself in a healthy way. Uh, Dr. Robinson is very supportive of uh, not only family, foot, family football, but family athletics. Uh, so is the leadership team, the board of trustees, um, everyone involved. And so it really forced us to come together, uh, pool our, our resources and, and you know, ideas um, to, to make sure that we were providing the best experience for our student athletes. And that's really what we want here at this university. And so um, what, what started off as a negative, uh, I, I think turned into a positive pretty quickly. And, and I'm happy to say that you know, today, uh, we have a great partnership with our administration uh, about what our students ultimately need to give themselves the best chance and opportunities to be successful. Week two of the actual season is actually week one of the SWAC. Now we're looking at year two in the SWAC overall for Florida A&M, and you bring in the Orange Blossom Classic uh, is South Florida, it's Hard Rock Stadium. Uh, you bring in Jackson State, uh, you look across the field and you see Jackson with Coach Prime. Uh, talk a little bit about that rivalry and that particular game. And again, this is one of those situations where you have two powerhouses on one side of the bracket. It's kind of like the Yankees and the Red Sox meeting up, and it's almost like a, a World Series or, or a, a Super Bowl, if you will. It's, it's the game, but it's right off the top. Talk a little bit about that concept of uh, the Orange Blossom Classic. Right. Um, when, when the Orange Blossom Classic was conceptualized a few years back, um, we were still members of the Mid-East Athletic Conference. And so, you know, we signed a three-year agreement with Jackson State, um, thinking it'd be a great kind of MEAC swag challenge, just like, you know, they have to begin the season. Um, unbeknownst to us, we were going to the SWAC, and uh, obviously with, with the conference realignment, adding two teams, um, Jackson stayed in the Eastern Division as well. And so to open the season um, with the divisional game, one that has, again, for the last two years, um, all implications as to who would win the East. Um, it's a game that obviously has a lot at stake. And so, um, you know, our fans like the game. It's in Miami early in the year, Labor Day weekend, so a long weekend. Um, but for two years in a row, you know, that game has has cost us an opportunity to to play for a SWAT championship. And so, whereas you know, conceptually the game is great, um, I, I you know would be a little bit better if, if the, the stakes weren't as high in that first weekend. You know, college football is unique in that aspect, that it's the only sport collegially and professionally uh, to where the regular season has so much weight on what happens in the postseason. Um, you know, one loss could knock you out of contention uh, pretty early, right? And there's no preseason to, to prepare you for what, for those games that, that's, that count significantly. So um, Jackson was breaking out a new offensive coordinator. So we really didn't have any film of him of what to study, what they were gonna run. Uh, and it was just a bad time for our football team coming off of the, the emotional high and lows of uh, the, the, the game against Carolina, the, the certification issues, the national attention that was given to the program, the open letter to our administration. Uh, there were just a lot of things mentally that these guys were battling and going through, not knowing who was gonna play or when they were gonna play. Um, and, and we just did not do a great job as a staff of being able to navigate all of that and prepare these guys for a huge game. And, you know, frankly, we laid an egg. Uh, the worst loss I've ever taken as a, as a, as a coach um, in conference. And uh, it, it was embarrassing. Um, but it was, a, it, was a, it was an opportunity for us as a football team to determine our worth and decide who we, go, who we were going to be. And, um, you know, we pulled ourselves up by our bootstraps and got ourselves together. And all we did after that was reel off nine straight wins. So, you know, what was a low point for this program uh, turned into a positive because again, it forced us to look ourselves in the mirror, um, not point fingers and decide individually as, as coaches, as players, as support staffers, whether we were really vested in this program the way we needed to be. And uh, once we were able to do that self-assessment, we were able to, to, to figure out what we needed to do moving forward. And, and again, it led us to, to finish with a nine and two record. Coach, you move into week three. 
uh, you move back home to the highest of seven hills. Now you look across the field and you see uh, Albany State University, the Golden Rams, a proud program who was very successful. Uh, talk a little bit about that game. And the final score is Rattlers 23, Golden Rams 13, the final. Uh, that's the first victory of those nine in a row, if you will. Uh, talk a little bit about that particular contest. Well, one, we knew that Albany State would be a tough outfit. Uh, during the COVID year, when we opted out, we had the fortune of, of scrimmaging Albany State. NCAA allowed us to do a couple of controlled scrimmages. And so they bust down and we were able to scrimmage. And uh, we saw right away that those guys play extremely hard. Um, they have a lot of, uh, a lot of passion, uh, a lot of pride. And, uh, and we, so we, we, it, was, it definitely wasn't the game that we were going to take lightly. And so we knew they were reigning SIC champions, had one of the top defenses in the country at the Division II level. And so we had to prepare ourselves for a dogfight and, um, you know, was able to come out with a 23-13 victory and, um, you know, just give us some confidence. You know, first win of the season, get that nasty taste out of our mouths, extended our home winning streak at that time to 11 games. And uh, so, again, we, we kind of built some momentum and went straight into a bye week and really gave us a chance to, to really um, work out some kinks uh, before we hit the long haul. So uh, all in all, I thought it was a productive week. Next stop, you get into a showdown, if you will, with Alabama A&M. Now, in that particular contest, you're talking about a Bulldogs team and it's life after uh, Mr. Glass. Uh, Coach Maynard and his guys put up a fight. Uh, the final score, 38 to 25. Uh, talk a little bit about the uh, Alabama uh, A&M Bulldogs game. Yeah, another home game. And uh, so, you know, coming in, we knew that day and then we'll come in hungry. Um, we came back last year from down 17 to beat them in Huntsville. So we knew that that would be in the back of their minds. And uh, they actually went up this year as well and uh, took an early lead. And uh, but our guys stayed resilient. They didn't panic. And we were able to come back and take a, a sizable lead and, uh, and ride it to a 13 point victory. So Again, another great win at home. Uh, standardized winning streak at home, 12 games, dating back to 2019. And, uh, you know, it brought us back to 500 in conference play, which was something that we definitely wanted to do and uh, to give ourselves some momentum as we really hit the, 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 thick, the thick part of our schedule. Now you shift gears and you move into October. October 1st, to be exact. Uh, the final score, Rattlers 34, Mississippi Valley State University, Delta Devils 7. Uh, what did that game look like and what are your takeaways? Well, Mississippi Valley is always a very tough team to prepare for. They play hard, um, you know, they're well coached. Uh, they had some turmoil. Um, they lost the offensive coordinator in the middle of that week. And so I'm sure they had a, a profound impact on how they were able to um, prepare offensively. And so they didn't have a great showing. Um, I think the head coach, who's a defensive guy, ended up having to call the offensive game for them that week. And so defensively, we were able to you know, keep those guys out of the end zone except once. And then offensively, we were able to put some drives together and do some good things. And so, you know, to have a 34-7 win at home, uh, get another home win, uh, up 13 games at that point. And, and then 2-1 and in conference play, which, gave again, gave us a winning record in conference early in the season. So um, big win for the program. And, you know, our student section and, and, and band and alumni side really, you know, did a great job of, of – coming to back-to-back -back home games, which is something that in the past may not have been the case. Coach, uh, you move forward and now you go out on the road. It's Orangeburg, South Carolina. It's Coach Buddy Pugh, Mr. Miak, one of the greatest coaches of all time, HBCU, the defending Celebration Bowl and HBCU national champions. Talk about going into Orangeburg and you outlast those Bulldogs by a final score of 20 to 14. Yeah, went into Orangeburg and, uh, you know, always a tough place to play. Obviously a conference foe from my time in the MEAC. And I uh, was able to go in and, and, and really jump out to an early lead, uh, 17 to nothing lead, um, comfortable, uh, rolling along. And then all of a sudden, um, Jeremy decided that he wanted to throw it to another team a little bit more than he wanted to throw it to ours. And uh, so two interceptions, back-to-back -back drives. And, they got rolling, hit uh, their big time receiver, Shaq Davis, for a big touchdown, and then we were able to score again. And before we knew it, it was 17-14 there in the fourth quarter. And, uh, you know, we were able to kick a field goal to 
go up 20 to 14 and uh, they got the ball back with a chance to drive in you know, for the winning touchdown. And uh, our defense was able to stop them on, on downs. Um, with, without our best player, Isaiah Land took a helmet to the knee that game and sidelined him for a few games. And so we were down to our, you know, backup defensive end, um, you know, when they were in a throwing situation. So uh, definitely a pressure packed game. And, uh, but we were able to come out of there with a huge victory. And, uh, but, it, but it was definitely a game that the fans, um, I think, enjoyed seeing. And that was probably the first instance of the, the, the cardiac rattlers uh, for this season with, with the offense to win close ball games. Next stop, you go out on the road again, and you're talking about October 15th at the Grambling State University. Now, what are we looking at? Two of the most iconic brands in the game, in the history. Uh, they had been to Bragg the year before, packed house, homecoming. This time, now you go into Grambling, Louisiana, into the bowl, if you will, um, and it's Coach Jackson in his first year and you're able to get past Grambling State University uh, by a final score of 20 to 16. Uh, another squeaker, uh, take us into uh, Grambling. Yeah, uh, you know, didn't mention about South Carolina game. Uh, it was actually South Carolina's first home game. Uh, and then we turn around in the next week and now uh, we're playing Grambling's first home game. So back to back weeks, uh, we're a team's debut home game. So you can imagine the environment, the atmosphere, you know, the first time you're playing a home game all season. So, uh, again, a hard-fought game. Um, you know, Gremlin played extremely tough. Their record wasn't great going into the game, but, you know, you couldn't tell that by the way they played. Uh, had a very dynamic quarterback, uh, made a bunch of plays with his legs, and, and it came out against the last drive. Uh, they had the ball on the 20, I think, the yard line, uh, going in to score. I threw a touchdown pass. We got called back for offensive pass interference which was obviously a push off. And so they definitely got it right. Um, but they, we had to stop them again on the last play of the game. And uh, we were able to get them off the field and preserve the big victory. But uh, again, you know, our defense really started to take shape around that time and understand their identity. Offensively, we were still trying to figure some things out. But uh, again, another huge win on the road, uh, conference win. And, and it really started to give our team a little bit of inspiration that hey we, we actually may be a pretty good team we can win in any, in any condition in a situation and um but again great to, to go on the road and beat a, a traditional powerhouse such as grandma state university october 29th calling all rattlers the highest of seven hills is homecoming uapb pine bluff comes in the golden lions they got skylar perry britain doc was still the coach at the time actually there was a coaching change. So right. uh, Treadwell was making his debut. Um, but talk a little bit about that particular game. It's homecoming and it's Rattlers 27, uh, Pine Bluff 6, the final. Yeah, another another game that was uh, you know tough as far as the transition. Um, they had made a change, coaching change uh, during that week. Um, Doc Gamble, you know, close friend of mine, we worked together uh, at Alcorn State back in 2012. So for them to relieve him of his duties the middle of the season and turn to Coach Treadwell, um, you know, he was an offensive play caller already, so we didn't think there would be a lot of change. And so our defense had a great game plan. Uh, I think we kept him out of the end zone, actually shut him out. Um, we threw an offensive interception for a touchdown that gave him seven points. And um, so, again, we played – Pretty well on offense, uh, had some costly turnovers there at the end that uh, in the game one allowed them to score. But again, great homecoming win, sellout crowd, um, just amazing atmosphere. And, and uh, you know, again, it was a reason why we're sitting there at that point rolling with a 14 game home win streak. Next stop, uh, you're talking about Southern University, the Jags. And we know what that looks like. Uh, you bring Dooley back. Uh, he has ties to both Grambling State and Southern. He's back, but you guys take care of business again in that one, and you win it by a final score of 30 to 16, and that's uh, November 5th. Uh, take us back to that particular contest. Well, obviously, you know, Coach Dooley is one of the you know, better coaches in, in black college football, has been for a long time, and been extremely successful as a play caller. And uh, so we knew uh, with another dynamic quarterback, that defensively we'd have to play uh, really well. And uh, up front um, was our toughest challenge. Uh, they were very active on the defensive line, really stout guys, 
And uh, they made it very difficult for us to consistently move the ball, but, you know, made up, made up, made up enough plays when we needed to. And I uh, was able to, again, come out of there with a comfortable 30 to 16 victory. Um, again, that ended our home season slate with a 5 0 record uh, for the third straight year and extended our home winning streak to 15 games, uh, again, which is something that we're very proud of. We had the second longest winning streak, home winning streak in the country. Uh, but again, big, big quality win against another blue blood program in Southern another one of our natural rivalries. And um, again, it was definitely great to get that victory at Bragg. Next stop, you go on the road and FAMU and the SWAC travels very well. Uh, you go right up the street, if you will, into uh, Montgomery, into uh, Alabama State University. Uh, take us into the land of the Hornets, a uh, beautiful stadium, uh, and you're able to uh, get, get it done in that particular contest. Yeah, no, it was um, definitely a, a ball game that uh, had Rattlers probably rushing to the hospital because of the nature of the game. Um, very close game, you know, windy conditions. So Jose, who was, was pretty automatic for the most part, missed three field goals. Um, we threw three interceptions. I, I turned the ball over three times uh, there in the red zone. And uh, it had a turn of on downs in the red zone. So it, it's one of the weirdest games I've ever, I've ever been a part of when you can turn the ball over three times in the red zone. You can, again, miss three field goals uh, and have a turnover on downs and get a punt block for a touchdown and still win the, fall, win the ball game. So just a, just a weird game. Obviously, we blocked the last field goal there um, with, with you know, no time left on the clock and we're trying to pull a touchdown. But a uh, very exciting win, um, not the prettiest win, but it was a win nonetheless. And it, it really felt good to come out of Montgomery uh, with another win to, you know, to get us to eight and two. And uh, we, we kind of figured that if we take care of business in the Classic, that we, we punch our ticket to the eight, uh, FCS playoffs once again. Um, but obviously we know that, that wasn't the case, but again, wouldn't trade the experience for the world because it was great to see our fans uh, celebrating there in Montgomery. Coach, the final there in Montgomery was uh, Rattlers 21, uh, Alabama State Hornets 14. Uh, then you shift gears, and then uh, we just had the classic. Uh, what are your final impressions and takeaways from the Florida Blue, Florida Classic, uh, FAMU 41, Bethune-Cookman University 20, the final? Yeah, was well, again, like I said earlier, just a great, great atmosphere, um, you know, found out the day before the game, that Isaiah Land and, and General Hunt you know, couldn't go. And so that gave me a little bit of anxiety, knowing that we really needed to play well up front on the defensive line. And when two of your top players are, are, are not playing, um, and, I, and I challenged the guys in the hotel Friday night uh, that somebody, someone else will have to step up. You know, who's going to be the guy that gets their name called tonight uh, that maybe no one heard before? And for us, that was Anthony Dunn. Um, Anthony Dunn, a true freshman defensive end from the Orlando area. Uh, had the game of his life, you know, three sacks, uh, four tackles for loss, you know, a strip and a fumble recovery and just played inspired football. And so, again, just some great individual efforts. Obviously, as David Smith, um, offensive game MVP, five catches, 73, 73 yards, a touchdown reception and threw a touchdown. Again, Jeremy played his best game. And um, again, defensively played lights out other than a couple of uh, you know, plays there at the end. But um Again, you know, that game is always going to be tough. We jumped out to an early lead, 27-7, going into halftime. We come out, we flat, and they punch one in, and then they have the ball and punch one in right at the start of the fourth quarter to bring them in the, to within seven. And uh, we were able to fake a punt to get us some momentum. We scored on that on that drive and then got it back there late, and I was able to run it in to the, 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 the clinch the game. But to have a 21-point victory over our in-state rival, um, second straight year of, of over 20 points, um, 20 point margin, uh, again, shows that we can be a dominant football team when, when we channel our energy the right way. Coach, uh, teams that uh, take care of business look forward to postseason play. And you did that again for the second straight year uh, with the nine game winning streak. And then take us back to Sunday as you learn that. Uh, you don't have a game to look forward to and what that was like and just the concept of not being able to, be able to play again this year. And, you know, a lot of people were looking forward to you guys playing and felt like you guys definitely deserved it. 
Yeah, no, it was, it was um, devastating, you know, to to get word that we didn't make it and then have to shift gears um, with the team from going to have a watch party to just meeting in the locker room and kind of having our um, closed, you know, season meeting. Um, it was tough. You know, we, we talked about the realities behind why we didn't get in, at least in our opinion. We talked about some of the things that we could have done better and how that will have an impact on how we do moving forward. Uh, and it was a challenge to both the outgoing seniors and the returning players to, to, to say, you know, what we want this program to look like in the, in the immediate future. And so um, tough meeting, but very productive meeting um, because we were able to get a lot of stuff done. But, you know, it, it kind of gives it a little bit different feeling uh, because when those guys enter that locker room Saturday night after beating Bethune by 21, None of them thought that was their last game. They all thought that that solidified our place in the FCS playoffs. Um, there were some teams that lost that weekend that we felt needed to lose for us to have a chance, and they indeed lost. Um, but it didn't happen, right? And so very, very disheartened and very disappointed um, and hurt for these young men because, again, what they've been able to do on the football field. And um, But, you know, life has gone on, and um, – we're trying to move on as a program and, you know, kind of recapping this past season and then obviously getting ready for, for a huge or a bigger season in 2023. Coach, uh, the SWAC and the MEAC meet annually in Atlanta in the Celebration Bowl, and they bring in two champions of both sides. Um, in terms of the other teams that are very successful, that won an opportunity, uh, talk a little bit about HBCU football and it's not being represented as maybe it should be uh, when you look at FCS playoffs. Uh, we, we see a and was in a, a title game, uh, but we don't see the HBCU representation in the FCS currently. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. And um, I was kind of keeping my fingers crossed, hoping that a and would win the game so that we can have an HBCU in the game. Um, and But when they got out, when they lost, Part of me said, well, that strengthens our chances because clearly they're not going to select the 2014 field and not put a, a, an HBCU who's, you know, who's worthy in the field. Uh, but I was definitely wrong on that one. They did just, just that. So, uh, but again, it's just discouraging to know that we have um, worthy teams, deserving teams that are left out in the cold and the excuses of that, you know, oh, we didn't perform well in the playoffs last year or that we had a bad loss to Jackson State uh, week one. Um, that happens in football, right? I mean, sometimes you don't, you, you just, the ball doesn't bounce your way. Um, Jackson, every bad thing that could have happened happened during that game and we're just in a bad space. And, um, you know, last year's playoff game, same, kind of same thing. We, we dealt, dealt with some early adversity that we didn't, handle well and things kind of snowballed and got out of hand uh, and the fact that they had the, the top offense in the nation as well right so um I, again it just it it, it it disappoints me because you're citing things that not saying they're not factual yes we did lose to jackson state we did lose to um southeastern but that was a playoff game in 21 and that was week one in 22. And then after that, we reel off nine straight. Um, and to not get in again, it, it still stings a little bit. Coach, you have some gentlemen there who are some of the greatest uh, rattlers. And it's tough to say because uh, they have really came out and showed it. Uh, when you look at Mr. Land and you look at uh, Mr. Smith um, and guys are moving forward and moving on. Uh, talk a little bit about your impressions of, of Isaiah Land. Just a, a warrior, you know, just a phenomenal football player, very tenacious guy, um, loves the game, loves FAMU, um, always is an, open, an, an overachiever. And so yeah, hopefully he um, does what he needs to do to position himself to be drafted and hopefully does get drafted and goes and makes the team a very happy ball club. But again, just an amazing football player and um, definitely one of all-time greats when it comes to to, to guys win the orange green that can rush the passer. Coach, uh, Xavier Smith, a, a young gentleman out of Haines City, all he does is, is uh, when, the, when the quarterbacks make all the, the throws, all he does is 
make all the plays. Talk a little bit about Xavier and, and how special he is as a human being and, and one of the greatest rattlers. Yeah, you're not going to find a better young man than Xavier Smith. Um, you know, it, it, he's a phenomenal football player on his own. If that was all he had, he'd still be a great player. But the fact that he's such a humble individual, that he's such an ambassador for Floyd and them, such a great teammate, leader of this bunch, that you, you just, again, you just, you, you can't help but want that young man to be successful. I mean, everyone, you know, everyone, but many people know his story. Walking on the family, working at Amazon, uh, fresh out of high school, and um, turning turning himself into one of the top players in America. So it's it's a, it's a tribute to his work ethic, his perseverance, his character, um, all the the seven else we talk about. He exhibits those things daily, and, and that's why Xavier Smith has become a household name as far as FCS wide receivers. Coach, the so-called off season includes recruiting. Uh, student athletes uh, continuing to work on their grades and their coursework. Talk a little bit about the so-called off-season. The only difference, in my opinion, and I'm a journalist, I don't know it like you do, is there's no games that are scheduled. Uh, but take us into what it can look like between now as you go forward into uh, spring ball. Yeah, you know, right now uh, when what we call a discretionary period. So no mandated activity. They're still able to lift weights on their own. They're able to come by the facility and, you know, do things on their own. But for us as, uh, as a staff, we're kind of recapping the season. Uh, and then we're getting organized and recruiting and assessing our needs, assessing our numbers to determine what our targets will be uh, in, the, in the early signing period and also uh, in the normal signing period in, in February. So again, it never stops because even though you're not preparing to coach a game, you're preparing to go look at the young men that are going to be uh, hopefully added to your program a year from now. And hopefully they walk into a situation, um, you know, where the program is on right footing and where it needs to be. Coach, in closing, are there any uh, final comments you want to make as we think about uh, the Rattlers way, uh, the highest of seven hills, FAMU football, uh, from my perspective, it's in a great place. Uh, as you, uh, you're the coach, it, or do you have any final comments as we think about the 2022 season and uh, what that was all about? Well, no, it's just it's been a fun ride. Um, again, just you know, can't thank Rattler Nation enough for their unwavering support, even when things seem you know, gloom at the, at the start of the season. Um, you know that made Rattler Nation even stronger to get behind these young men. And so just, just very thankful, very blessed to, to work in an institution that's so passionate about their football and that are willing to pour into these young men and everything they do. And so um, we have a charge to, to keep it going as coaches and players. Uh, we understand that. And so we're working diligently to continue to grow and build this program to be um, the program that, that Rattler Nation wants to see. And so just, again, excited about what the future holds, um, excited about the young men that we'll be adding to the fold here, hopefully shortly, and excited about all the guys that are returning from this past year. And um, definitely want to thank again the seniors, the guys that have um, bled, sweated, and cried for this program. So some a year, some two, three, four, five, and Xavier and Svadul's case, even six years um, to, to, to leave their mark in this program. And, um, I can't thank them enough. That my gratitude is, is through the roof for what these young men have meant to this program. And uh, every day I wake up, I'm blessed to, to call myself the head football coach at Florida a University. Well, folks, there you have it from Willie Simmons, the head football coach of the Florida A&M University Rattlers. Obviously, they are victors in the Florida Classic back-to-back -back years. I'm James Hill. You're watching James Hill Sports. We'll be right back.